Hello, and welcome back to Russ's Movie Corner. My name is Russ, and as you can see, I am sitting in front of my movie corner. I have my Star Wars The Last Jedi t-shirt on, and I have my Star Wars The Last Jedi DVD right next to me. And judging by the frame around me, I'm doing a video um, on a... This is one of the first videos I did on my channel, okay? Um, this is, I, I think I called it the Six Fallacies Rebuttal, but this is this, this is uh, Brandon from Left Foot Media um, basically doing a, a video titled uh, Six Things That Fans of The Last Jedi Are Getting Wrong. And I did this video um, because right after I had um, gone through the... I watched The Last Jedi. I'd, I'd seen a lot of hate coming out. <clears throat> and I saw this video kind of crop up in my feed. And I was like, and I was like, wow, this, this guy really doesn't provide anything of substance to any of the arguments that he's putting forth. Most of it is subjective based upon you know, sort of a, a, a rushed initial, um, you know, sort of, <clears throat> sort of a rushed initial uh, glance of the of the Last Jedi, and he hasn't really watched the film, which is why people were telling him you need to watch the film again, not because it's high art, not because it's anything like that. It was because you just missed the point that it's Star Wars. You need to go in thinking this is Star Wars. I'm going to watch a Star Wars film, and you'll see that it's a Star Wars film. Problem is, people walked in like they did in Episode One, thinking, "Oh, it's this Star Wars film," and then it's like the film delivers, and they're like, "Well, that was crap. I don't understand." Me. So, you know, I mean, it's 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 all just crud that they don't that that they try to come across as well. You know, we think it's it's not. Okay, that's your opinion. Show me why. Tell me why. Well, we just think it's not. That's not an argument. You have to have a lore-related reason as to why it's not Star Wars. And he'll sit there and say, oh, well, the story uh, has you know missing so much in it. Okay, give me some examples. Oh, well, the story's just missing so much. That's not an example, dude. Come on. Give me something. You're telling me it's crap. Give me something why it's crap. No, oh, it's just crap. Not, that's not a reason, man. And I didn't articulate that the first time. Okay? And so... And, 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 and like I said, on his channel... There's a whole bunch of... Stuff that... I could go into and just rip apart. And I think I might do that just because I think it needs to be done so that people understand that when you try to say that something isn't good or something is crap and you don't provide a lore-related reason for it. I mean, it's kind of like with my Dune video that I did just recently as of filming this. It's kind of like clickbait. You're you're just saying this is crap, but you're not giving us any reason as to why it's crap. And it's like this was this was something that um, Discourse Miniatures did a video um, where she wa or she read an article from Bell of Lost Souls, okay, where they talked about third party miniatures ruining Warhammer 40k. And she agreed with the fact that, you know, third-party miniatures forced Games Workshop to change rules, to change miniature out loadouts, to change their whole paradigm. But it wasn't for the reason that the article was saying, because the article was just clickbait bullshit. It was because of the Chapter House trial, and she did an entire, like... 40 minute to an hour video on like the chapter house trial <laughs> uh, 
I mean, she dug way into the court transcripts, and I mean, she she dug out all these reasons. I mean, it was a well-researched video on it. And then she's sitting there reading this article, and then it's like she gets down to the end, and the guy goes, "You know, um, you know, uh, there's there's a you know there's a whole lot that's wrong, and I you know, and there's and there's no real easy answers." And she's like, "Yep, we're gonna have to kind of noodle down in there. We're gonna have to you know really pound in. We're gonna have to we're gonna have to solve this." And then he goes, and I don't have any easy answers. And then it, and then it stops. <laughs> Something like that. And she's like, uh, what? <laughs> like, you can't just come out and say one thing and then turn around and just throw everything out. Throw the baby out with the bathwater. That doesn't work. And that's what's happening here. This guy is doing the same thing that that Bell of Lost Souls article did. Is it, and also the clickbait article about Dune Part Two? There's no lore behind it. There's just there's just people going, we don't like it, and so it has to change. What has to change? It just has to change. What? I mean, right at the end, if you go back and you watch from about six thirty on the video up until now you'll hear that he talks about all these story problems but he doesn't bring up a single problem with the story like he doesn't say you know like it doesn't explain why Luke was hiding out on Acto it doesn't explain why there was this going on it doesn't explain why this is going on. it doesn't explain this he doesn't bring up any specifics he just says they're story problems that's not an argument, son. That's your subjective opinion. That you think that there's story-related problems because we're in the middle of a trilogy. There's there's literally two other films in the trilogy. Force Awakens, Last Jedi, Rise of Skywalker. And if you're not going to take those in the context with which they were with which they were done, then I'm sorry to say that yeah, there's probably going to be a lot of story problems. I mean, and I think I brought this up originally. If you take the two towers just by itself, just the two towers, you go watch this without knowing Fellowship of the Ring, without knowing Return of the King, you just go and watch this. Okay? Let's say you had never heard of Lord of the Rings before, and some people were coming to you and saying, Oh my gosh, you got to see this movie. It is so epic. And you sat down and you watched this. You would go, What in the hell is going on? How in the hell is this a good film? I don't understand anything that's going on. Why is this dude carrying a ring? Why Why are they being chased by this gangly creature? Who is this Boromir fellow? Who is Aragorn? Who is Glegolas? Who is Gimli? Who's this Gandalf fellow and why was he fighting this dude on a bridge and then and then he comes back later as a white in, in a white clothes instead of the gray clothes he had on at the beginning? I don't understand it. Yeah, you'd think there was a lot wrong with the story, wouldn't you? If you're taking this as, like, just one single film, you'd be like, there is so much missing here. There are so many plot holes with this thing because I don't understand what's going on. And it's, and it's almost like some of these people are going, The Last Jedi has so many story-related problems. W what problems? Well, it doesn't explain why Luke is hiding out on Acto. Yes, it does. No, it doesn't. Yes, it does. <laughs> like, they literally brought it up that, you know, Luke was training, like, like, like Han mentions it in the first film, Luke was training a new generation of Jedi and one student turned against him. So he went looking for the first Jedi temple. Then when he gets there, he's like, I came to this island to die because, you know, I, I, I had this apprentice and, and he turned to the dark side. I, I mean, what, what more story reason do you want? It's what Luke did. I mean, come on. <laughs> that's stupid. But that's my problem, is, is that so many people 
do this kind of crap and it pisses me off because if you're not going to bring up specifics don't come at me you won't win the third fallacy i'm hearing a lot of is this claim that people like me who are critical of the last jedi somehow were just upset about the fact that there was a character development that happened with luke skywalker and and perhaps maybe some of our other favorite characters from star wars and and we really didn't like the character development that happened or we we didn't believe that you should ever change luke skywalker from what he was say at the end of return of the jedi that's absolute nonsense there's absolutely no problem at all with character development in fact i'm someone if you watch my other videos I, I actually thought that Luke and the way they created him as this disillusioned and sort of old Jedi who had lost faith really in humanity I, I liked that aspect and I thought that was great character development but, but here's the problem the problem is not with developing a character and changing the char character in new directions as they age and the story develops the problem is the way that was executed you've actually got to earn some of these things here because Luke Skywalker is one of the most established characters in cinematic history by what metric are you saying that? Because if you take it, the only films we have of Luke Skywalker, the only films we have of Luke Skywalker are these. That's it. You're calling this an established, the most established character in cinematic history? I'm sorry, son. Vader's more established than he is. The only thing that establishes his character in this is that he's a whiny little bitch. <laughs> I'm sorry to say that. But like I said, I will shit on the original trilogy to make a point. Okay? Episode 4, and most of the way through episode 5, he is a whiny little bitch. And it only isn't until episode 6 that he finally starts to grow up a little bit. But even then, it's like he still like whines to bed. I don't know how I'm going to kill my own father. Suck it up, man. Grow a pair. That's who he is. In fact, Ryan Johnson himself said, you know... When when given the choice, he was he was actually presented. Basically, J.J. Abrams came to him and said, "Here's outline A. Here's outline B." And there was a reason why he showed Luke with Ray holding the lightsaber out to him because it was a choice. <coughs> It was a choice of train or don't. And Ryan Johnson said, looking through the lens of the original trilogy and knowing the backstory of Kylo Ren and the history between Luke and Kylo, given the choice... Luke tosses the saber every time. And that's how he wrote the story. Because he didn't believe that Luke would just willingly train someone willy-nilly. That, And also because it would be a subversion of expectation because people would expect, you know would expect him to accept the saber and like and like kind of go oh it's my father's old saber hey i'll train you why would he what what reason does he have to train ray hmm answer me that and then we'll continue because nowhere in here does it say that he's going to train every single new generation of Jedi? Especially if he's failed. Because what does he do when he fails? 
Pew! He takes off. That's his character. So no, he's not the most established character in, in canon. Okay? Um, now, let me see how... Since the fiery collapse of his Jedi training temple, Luke Skywalker has put that part of his life behind him, focusing instead on the task of living on Akto. In many ways, the, tale, the toil of his existence on the island mirrors his youth spent on Tatooine. The chores he spent great energy avoiding in his teen years now mark the clock of his long, tire, uh, tiring island days. The native caretakers pay Luke a little mind, for though his spirit is troubled and his view of the Jedi is clouded, he exhibits no outward ill will to the island itself and the history it contains. Skywalker has instead respected what island life asks of him, and has carved out a place for himself in this harsh environment. And it says, um, despite living on an island... Drenched in the Force, Luke has cut off all connection to the mystical energy field. Luke was unaware of the fate that befell Han Solo, or of the interstellar cataclysm that wiped out countless lives in the Hosnian system. Exile interrupted. Luke did not expect Ray's arrival in the Millennium Falcon, or for his past to come crashing back into his island life, life like an ocean wave. He has lost track of time on, on the island, the result of his willful neglect, as well as a mysterious quality... The world shares with such force-infused locales as Dagobah and Mortis. News of the disaster that has befallen the galaxy shocks him out of his isolation. The past will not be buried. And then it says, Luke Skywalker, The Last Jedi. The first in a new era of Jedi Knights, Luke Skywalker took it upon himself to pass on what he has learned, what he had learned. But before restarting the Jedi Order, he had many questions that needed answering. The Empire had, ex had expended much effort in eradicating the history of the Jedi. So, Skywalker's research into the past was slow and difficult. His questions resulted in a journey that took years as he chased down every remnant of Jedi lore he could find in an effort to piece together a fragmented past. This quest Luke led Luke to understand much about himself and his destiny, and gave him the confidence needed to revive the Order. says Jedi Rekindled. Skywalker's first student was to be his sister, Leia. However, she ultimately decided that the best path for her to serve the galaxy left no room for extended isolation of Jedi training. As Leia concentrated on her new family and senatorial politics, Luke began his travels, largely disappearing from galactic view. During his lengthy journey, Skywalker gathered disciples who would go on to become his first students. Flames of Failure. Skywalker kept the location of his Jedi training temple a strict secret, known only to members of his burgeoning order. When he found it ablaze, the grounds littered by slaughtered students, he knew the betrayal came from within. It was his nephew, consumed by darkness, who had led its destruction. The wider galaxy would not know of this calamity for years to come. Says so Luke's donning of ceremonial roles is not an indication of a return to faith. Rather, Luke sees it as his last rite to end the order. Skywalker's studies reveal the cynical nature of the struggle between light and dark and the massive toll the galaxy pays with each cycle. So basically, like, what it was is, is Luke, basically, here again, Luke found that, you know, and, and, and this is something that they, they teetered with a little bit in both um, the Thrawn trilogy and the Jedi Academy trilogy was... Luke only received instruction, brief instruction from Ben before he was struck down by Vader, and a few months training at the hands of Yoda before he went off to fight Vader on Cloud City. Then he had to learn basically all the rest of it on his own because Yoda goes and passes on <laughs> into the Force, and he's going, 
pass on what I've learned, huh? <laughs> How the hell am I supposed to do that? I don't even know where to start. And so <clears throat> he basically went out and found a whole bunch of old Jedi teachings and he had done some different things. He had also started a journal where he had been chronicling following certain people that had ties to the dark side or to the Empire at large. And he kind of found some, you know, things out. And then he went out and used some of that information. And that's why he's like, you know, these sacred texts were some of the first written by the Jedi. And they're some of the last... And, and like me, they're the last of the Jedi religion. And he calls it a religion. Why? Because in the scene where he's, you know, showing Rey the Force, right? You know, he's like, the Force doesn't belong to light or dark. The Force is just the Force. It's the person wielding it that create, you know, that creates that that sort of either light side or dark side. There's no strict, oh, you know, this side of the force is light, this side of the force is dark, and it's always, in, no, it's the force is the force, it's just the person wielding it in here. And that's why he calls it the Jedi religion, because he's like, I'll give you three lessons, and in those three lessons, why the Jedi need to die. Because every time, every time, one side came up, the other side rose up to meet it, and there was usually some gigantic calamity. Always. Case in point, Malachor 5. The, the Mandalorians came out, and they were slaughtering people, so Revan took himself and the Jedi exile out, and they went out, and they fought and they ended up using this horrendous weapon called the Mass Shadow Generator that destroyed the entire planet of Malachor V. And it created, it basically turned Revan and Malak to the dark side, and it created a, a, it created a tear so horrible that it literally cut the Jedi Exile off from the Force. And Skywalker learns of this, and he's like, holy crap. And you know, here come the Jedi, and they had 10,000 Jedi at one point in the galaxy that were going around and doing all these things that the people had come to rely on, and then here comes Sidious, and in the course of about 13 years, he crippled the entire Jedi Order down to less than, like, 100 members across the entire galaxy and that were systematically hunted down by by Vader and and Palpatine and allowed the dark side to rise to the point where the death stars were created where they ended worlds and then he ends Palpatine and you know Vader you know helps with that but when he started to bring the Jedi back in comes the First Order and corrupts a student of his to the point where he feels like he has no alternative but to kill his own nephew to end the threat. But he doesn't and the First Order becomes Ascendant and all of his students are wiped out. He feels responsible. That's the slow reveal. Okay. That's the slow reveal. And I remember somebody asked me just a little while ago when I was on um, I was on a Facebook post and some guy was like, you know, um, you know, I, I, I don't understand where um, you know this whole thing fits in and blah blah blah. And so I took a picture of it and it basically was Um, 19, before Starkiller Incident, Luke begins training Ben. 
Um, sensing the continued presence of the dark side, Luke starts investigating um, leading uh, uh, leads that mention Exegol at 13 before Starkiller incident. And then Ben Solo destroys Luke Jedi Temple. Luke vanishes. Han and Leia drift apart at 6 before Starkiller incident. So there you are. <clears throat> and he says, you know, you've you got to earn it. Well, I don't understand. It earns it through the slow reveal of what actually happened. Because we see it in a, in a flashback that Rey has in the Force. Right? When she first touches um, Luke's old lightsaber, Anakin's old lightsaber, when she touches it, the Force shows her a vision... And part of that vision is, you know, Luke putting his hand up on R2 with, you know, the temple in flames around him. And so we get the sense that something happened. And that's why Luke disappeared. Okay. And like I said, we, we hear that Han said that he was training a new generation of Jedi. And, you know, they, they ended up getting wiped out by a student of his who turned to the dark side. And Luke felt responsible, so he left. And you know those that those that knew him best, meaning him and him and Leia, and probably you know Wedge and a few others, were basically like, you know, we we thought he went looking for the first Jedi Temple to try to you know recenter himself, and you know maybe then come back and try to train another generation of Jedi, but he never came back. He disappeared. We don't know what happened to him. So. <coughs> So when Ray gets there, okay, you get that slow reveal over the three scenes. The first scene is him just saying, you know, there were flashes of darkness in Ben's training, and you know he he eventually turned against me and and killed all my students. Then you see it from Ben's perspective, where he says, you know. Skywalker wanted my wanted my power, and you know he he sensed my he sensed my becoming, and he wanted my power, and you know he he was you know gonna do this, and and so he came out there to confront me, and then in the third scene, Luke finally tells Ray the truth, basically saying, yeah, I went out there, I probed, he was asleep because I was gonna confront him, but he was asleep, and as I was probing his future in the force wasn't creepily reading his mind he was using the force to probe Ben's future he saw the deaths of his students and in one moment one fleeting instant he thought he could end it all by killing his own nephew but he realized that, that wasn't going to solve the problem but in that moment is when Ben woke up. And so Ben is looking up at his uncle, standing over him with an ignited lightsaber, poised and ready to strike. Two different points of view. Two totally different points of view. If that's not earning it, nothing will. Because as Ben said... In episode 6, when Luke turns to him and says, You told me Vader betrayed and murdered my father. And Ben goes, Yeah, what I told you was true from a certain point of view. And Luke's like, A certain point of view? And Luke goes, And, and Ben goes, Luke, you have to understand that many of the truths we cling to depend greatly on our own point of view. And that's when he says, Anakin was a good friend. But the minute that he fell victim to the dark side and became Darth Vader, the good man that was your father was destroyed. So what I told you was true from a certain point of view. Because in his mind, on Mustafar, when he was fighting Anakin, who was like his brother, he sensed that the man that he had trained, the man that had become that brother, was gone. 
when he was laying on that hillside in flames. When he was like, you were my brother, Anakin! I loved you! In that moment, in, 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 in Obi-Wan's mind, Anakin Skywalker was no more. Even though Padme was like, there's still good in him. He's like, no, there isn't. Because in his mind, all Anakin is now is the dark side. That's it. Because in his heart of hearts, he can't believe that he, that a person that he loved that much would go that far. It's the same thing here. That's the lore reason. Is Luke was entrusted by Leia and Han to train their son. Because Leia had sensed that at the end of her Jedi training, she never fully stopped being, I mean, she, she got trained as a Jedi, but she sensed in the future that as soon as she finished her Jedi training, that it would be her death. What she was seeing was that her own son was going to cause that death. She didn't know it at that time. So she basically told Luke, I'm not going to finish the Jedi training. I'm going to take what you've taught me, and I'm going to go serve the galaxy the way that I know how. So she trained as a Jedi. We see that in Episode Nine. She trained as a Jedi, but then she took a step back from that, and she gave Luke her lightsaber and said, "I don't, I, I don't want the burden of what I've seen through the Force. I'm going to go live my life and serve the galaxy in the way that I know how." And then she found out that her own son murdered all of the people and turned to the dark side. What she didn't know was that the catalyst was Luke. Because Luke didn't tell her. And it wasn't until they were on crate that she finally was like, it's fine. I understand. Even though it's a force projection, and I think she realizes that it's a force projection, I think she realizes that, you know, it was it was Luke's way of coming in and saying, I'm sorry for what I did. And in her own way, she tells him, it's okay. I don't blame you. And that's what allows Luke to walk out that door and go face down Ben on crate is Leia's forgiveness. Let's continue. His, his story is just so well known by so many people and his character traits are so well established. And if you're going to do something like drastically shift his character in another direction, you've got to earn that. You've actually got to write good story points to get us from where he was at the end of Return of the Jedi to where you want to take him in this film. Like See, this is this is where I kind of take issue with some of the things that are said here because not everything can be told. You can't tell you know, 35, 40 years of, of story in two hours. <laughs> it's not going to happen. Some things have to be told in flashbacks. Some things have to be told in other media. And the way that Ryan Johnson chose to reveal this through the slow reveal of those three scenes that I talked about is... It was the perfect way to encapsulate the character of um, of Luke Skywalker, of where he was when he started his when he started training his students, and then where he is now, and why that is. Because you understand that it broke him, and it took. 
Yoda showing up with his gimmer stick, like smacking him in the face with it. Going, you idiot. I failed, but I still trained you. Hello? I could have just thrown you off Dagobah, but I didn't. His line there is very telling. We are what they grow beyond as masters. Yes, you you <coughs> you pass on all the good, but you have to pass on the failure too. Because they have to understand. And that's and that's like one of the things that makes that scene in episode in episode 9 so poignant when Ray is, you know, kind of you know, burning the the Kylo's um, TIE fighter and you know and then she she tries to throw the lightsaber in and then he catches it and he's like a Jedi's weapon deserves more respect you know and then she's like Master Skywalker and he's like what are you doing here and she's like I'm doing what you did I'm right he's like I was wrong did you miss that point I'm pretty sure you did, considering your, your other videos about Rise of Skywalker, because you have no clue what lore actually is. You see what I'm saying? You have to do it the correct way. Now, I want you to listen to what this guy's going to talk about, because this is what makes my blood boil. Because I've got no problem with where they wanted to take him in this film. The problem is, from point A to point B, Return of the Jedi to The Last Jedi, this bit in between is where they failed. And, and one really classic example of this, it's, it's not the fact that he's a, a wizened old Jedi and he's upset and angry at the world. It's, it's the fact that they didn't really give a good motivation for what happened between him and Kylo Ren. My younger brother Tim said to me that uh, what they should have done in his uh, version of the movie, this is what they would have done anyway, was they should have had uh, Luke Skywalker realise what was going on with Kylo Ren and then refused uh, to, to refuse to carry on with the training. And that would have been the trigger for Kylo Ren that got him so uh, angry and upset that he just flipped out and, and destroyed the Jedi Academy. What I suggested was that they should also add another little plot point in there that perhaps Luke realised that Kylo Ren was getting out of control and so he thinks, well, if I go and leave my students in the care of the elderly staff, I can go and find Leia, his mother, bring her back, and she can talk to Kylo Ren and convince him uh, perhaps to, to tone things down a bit and, and, and we can perhaps bring him back from the brink here. And while he's away trying to retrieve Leia, that's when Kylo Ren flips out and he, he says to everyone who's gathered there that you're either with me or against me, which is the theme we've seen before with the whole Sith thing. And what happens is that those who go with him become the Knights of Ren, which satisfies that plot point, and those who don't, he slaughters and destroys the place. And then Luke gets back and discovers this and this is the thing that breaks his heart and breaks his spirit. Instead, what we get in this film, though, is this absurd idea of Luke Skywalker and what I would describe as a Frank Spencer-esque moment. If you don't know who Frank Spencer is, uh, after you've watched this video, go and Google or look up on YouTube British comedy Frank Spencer, and you will see what I mean. Frank Spencer was this bumbling idiot of a character who always made an absolute mess of things. And here is this moment with Luke Skywalker. He is in, in a really creepy sort of way, is in Kylo Ren's hut at night while he's sleeping. He's got his lightsaber there, and he has contemplating murdering his own nephew. Now, if you're going to get to that point, you're going to try and take us as an audience to that point in a very well-established story, you've actually got to earn that. You can't just have Luke suddenly going, I think maybe murdering my, my nephew might be the way to solve this problem. And then we have this Frank Spencer-esque moment where he's standing there. Oh, I've ignited me lightsaber, Mr. Kylo. No, it's all misunderstanding. I don't really want to kill you. Oh, please don't use the force on me. And it's this absurd moment of, of, of mistaken identity and, and I'm going to possibly murder my own nephew. It just... It just had no place in this film, and it's a terrible plot point. It's bad writing. It's just bad writing. There's okay.
past that point. So this is from Ben's point of view. Um, so this is the thing. Um, so it says, this is when when uh, Ray and um, and and Kylo make a connection through the Force, and she's, you know talking to him and then you know she says I'd rather not do this now yeah me too said Kylo stealing herself she turned determined not to let her adversary into her head this time she would make him answer for what he'd done why did you hate your father she demanded then stopped oh Kylo was stripped to the waist in his chambers the angry scar she'd given him in their duel snaked down his face and neck and across his collarbone her eyes rose but Kylo was unruffled by the sight of her and seemingly undisturbed by her question because he was a weak-minded fool he said Ray forced herself to look into his eyes, those angry, haunted, needy eyes. I don't believe you, she said. You're going to... Do you have a cowl or something you can put on? Kylo ignored that. Ray made herself focus. Why did you hate your father? Give me an honest answer. I will when you ask an honest question, Kylo said. And she wanted to scream at him. He wasn't her teacher. And anyway, what posi And anyway, that position was no longer open. Why did you hate Han Solo, she asked. No, Kylo said dismissively, almost bored. But Ray wouldn't let him escape so easily. You had a father who loved you. He gave a damn about you. I didn't hate him. Then why, she demanded. Why what? Why what? Say it. Why did you kill him? I don't understand. No. Kylo's curiosity was genuine and infuriating. Your parents threw you away like garbage. They didn't, Ray said. And she hated the fact that even her, and that even to her own ears, she sounded like she was pleading. The strange contact between their minds had given her insight into his powers and helped unleash her own, but it had also let him pillage her memories and feelings. But there was no way the Force could have told him that, shown him that. That was right, wasn't it? They did, Kylo said. But still you can't stop needing them. It's your greatest weakness. He looked for them everywhere, in Han Solo, now in Skywalker. His gaze was hungry and knowing. Did he tell you what happened that night? Kylo asked. Yes, Ray said, knowing that Kylo could see it wasn't, that wasn't true. No, he said. This is Ben's point of view. Ben Solo, no longer a boy, but not yet a man, looks up in surprise and alarm. His Uncle Luke is coming to his chambers at night, now stands over him. The, Jedi's ma the Jedi Master's face is twisted in a snarl, lit by the green, green blade of his lightsaber. The Force is a boil with danger. For a moment, regret shadows Luke's face, but Ben can't, can see his uncle has gone too far to turn back. He will not falter or hesitate. Rather, he will bring his lightsaber down and cleave his nephew in two while he sleeps. Desperate, Ben's hand reaches out, not towards Luke, but beyond him to the lightsaber he has constructed. Willing it into his hand, a blue blade blocks a killing blow. The blades lock, buzz, and spark. But Ben knows this is only a brief reprieve. He can't resist his master's far greater powers for long. Trapped, he reaches up towards the ceiling with his free hand, begging the stones to heed his plea and come crashing down on Luke's head to save him. He'd sensed my powers. He senses yours, Kylo says. And he feared it. Liar, Ray said. But there was no conviction behind it. She could feel that what Kylo had told her was true, or at least he wasn't trying to mislead her, and hadn't she sensed Luke guilt and self-reproach? What if he had gone into exile, not because of what the apprentice had done to the teacher, but because of what the teacher had done to the apprentice? Let the past die, said Ky Kylo said. Kill it if you have to. It's the only way to become what you are meant to be. And then he was gone, leaving her alone in the night. Alone, but knowing she had one final thing to do. Only then would she leave Master Skywalker's refuse forever. Jaw set, Ray strode off across the rocky highlands in the opposite direction from the Falcon. Okay. Uh, then he comes back into um, the thing, and then blah, blah, blah. Okay. So right after they... Uh, they, they they touch Ben and, and Ray in the hut after she goes into the dark side cave to find out about her parents in the dark side cave 
only shows what the dark side shows, that is the reflection of yourself, your darker inner self. Okay. Um, Luke Skywalker walked into the hut to find Ray and Kylo with their hands clasped, staring each into each other's eyes. Stop! He yelled and flung out his hand. A burst of power hurled every stone from the hut outward from its center, scattering them around the bench where Ray and Kylo sat in astonishment. Ray's hand closed on nothing, and she stared at Luke as rain pelted them. She got to her feet and stared at the Jedi Master. Is it true? She demanded. Did you try to murder him? Leave this island, Luke said through gritted teeth. Now! Then he turned and walked away, just as he'd done the day she'd arrived, bearing the lightsaber that he had called to her. That had called to her. That day she had just watched, bewildered and hurt, but that had somehow become a long time ago. No, Ray said. You answer me. Tell me the truth. Stop! Luke kept walking, so Ray snatched up her staff, took three long strides, swung it flat and hard, cracking him across the back of the head and knocking him to the ground. He stared up into the rain, surprised at the young woman standing over him with her teeth bared. Did you do it? she asked. Did you create Kylo Ren? Luke got to his feet, and Ray saw immediately that nothing had changed. He was still going to walk away from her, retreating to brood in silence. Furious, she swung her staff at him again, but Luke reached out. The motion of blur and the length of a lightning rod flew off the roof of one of the huts. Before Ray could blink, he had intercepted the strike of her staff, the impact sending a jolt up her forearms and knocked her backward. Ray sprang back at him, her staff and, and his improvised weapon spinning and colliding as the rain poured down. She pressed the attack. The staff had never felt more comfortable in her hands, so much like a part of her. Her confidence grew, and she smiled wolfishly as she saw the surprise on his face. But it was a fleeting thing. Quicker than she could follow, he parried her thrust and continued the motion, flipping the staff out of her hands to clatter on the stones, leaving her defenseless. Ray reached out, feeling the force alive and hungry around her, and found the weight of her lightsaber in her hands. She ignited it, and Luke gave ground, looking up at her as she held the blade high, rain hissing and sparking off its length. They looked at each other for a long moment, then Ray turned the lightsaber off, leaving them in the rain. Tell me the truth, she said. Here it is. Luke Skywalker looks down at his nephew, Ben Solo. No longer a boy, but not yet a man. He has come into his chambers at night, and now stands over him. The, Jedi's, the Jedi Master's eyes are closed. The Force is a boil with danger. Worry shadows Luke's face as he extends his hand, reaching out with the Force, reaching into the sleeping Ben's mind. The boy remains still, his face untroubled, and Luke's eyes remain shut, but he can see fire and rain and ruin and the sightless eyes of the dead, and he can hear screams and the howl of lightsabers and the roar of explosions. Darkness expanding from the slim, dark-haired boy to shroud everything and the cacophony of terror that will accompany it. Luke draws his hand back as if burned. The force around Ben has always been shot through with veins of darkness, but what he's seen is beyond anything he'd feared to find. Luke removes his lightsaber from his belt and ignites the blade, his eyes grave. But then he looks at Ben, and in the brief, almost unwilling thought is gone. He cannot bring his lightsaber down on his sister's son while he sleeps, and immediately Luke knows it's too late. He has already failed his student, because Ben's eyes are open, frightened but aware. The boy's power with the Force are already immense and still growing, and he is a Skywalker. He knows what Luke thought. He knows what Luke saw. He knows what he will be. Desperate, Ben's hand reaches out toward... Not toward Luke, but beyond him, to the lightsaber he has constructed. Willing it into his hand, the blue blade, a killing blow aimed at his master, Luke's own blade, meets Ben's and the locked lightsaber's buzz and spark. Then Ben reaches up towards the ceiling with his free hand, compelling the stones to come crashing down on Luke's head. Ray touched Luke's arm. You failed him by thinking his choice was made, she said. Her voice equal parts gentle and insistent. It wasn't. There is still conflict in him. If he were turned from the dark side, he could shift the tide. This could be how we win. Luke turned his eyes to her. His gaze was bleak, and for the first time in Ray's memory, he struck her as old, broken man, dragged back into a storm he thought he had escaped. But his voice was strong, insistent. This is not going to go the way you think, he warned her. It is. Just now, when we touched hand, I saw his future. I saw it as solid as I am seeing you. If I go to him, Ben Solo will turn. Ray, don't do this, Luke said. Ray's answer was to hold the unlit lightsaber out to him once again, last invitation. She knew immediately that he would not accept it. Then he is our last hope, she said. She turned and simply walked away from him. So now you understand. He's he's looking through the future to see if Ben is actually going to do what he's going to do. Because she had, he had seen those moments of darkness in his training. And it's something that he actually says in the film. She's like, I, 
it, he he actually kind of you know that that one, that whole paragraph was actually kind of summed up in in about four or five words that 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 whole structure of you know it's like ben not quite a man not you know but not you know more than a boy but not yet a man you know that whole section is summed up by luke in about three or four sentences in the movie he basically just kind of says you know there were flashes of of darkness that i'd seen in his training and then it shows the scene of him in there you know using the force to probe his future okay it's not that he's it's not that he's reading his mind it's he's reading the future by using the force to reach through his mind okay because the force connects all living things okay so it's not that he's sitting there like you know as a telepath like ripping thoughts out of his head he's using the force to probe you know what's what's guiding ben what is this darkness that is that is that i'm seeing in his future okay he's just using he's just you know holding his hand out like this to sort of like use the force to probe ben you know through his mind that way it's not that he's creepily reading his mind it's something that he has been seeing you talk about not earning it that's fucking earning it right there okay he's he's literally he literally says that there's been moments in his training where all I see is darkness in him. And I know he's a Skywalker. He has that mighty Skywalker blood. He actually says that in the first time that he talks to um, Ray. He goes, and then here comes Ben Solo with that mighty Skywalker blood. Why? Because he felt it himself on Endor when he was fighting with the Emperor and, and Vader. You know, he felt it before when he was when he was, you know, fighting Vader the first time on Cloud City, you know. Ben told him, don't give in to hate. That leads to the dark side. Well, what did he do? He gave in to hate. I mean, for fuck's sake, dude. Watch the fucking film. It's all there. Okay? And if you can't watch it and say, wow, they actually, you know, they actually did explain the story very well, then I'm sorry. You're an ignoramus and you're an idiot. No other way to put it. What they should have done was actually found a properly executed and effective way of creating and crafting that part of the story so it actually made sense and was consistent with what has already been well established. And that was one of the big things for a lot of people. Um, no, actually. Um, most people um, that have a problem with that once you explain it to them the way that i just did they actually go oh wait that was in the movie uh yeah that was in the movie and then they go back and they actually watch the film as we talked about previously in the first and second fallacies if you go back and watch the film you will actually see that people do that now see this is one of the things that pisses me off about this type of person is he goes, well, see, my brother was saying that, you know, he would have done it this way, and then, you know, I would have taken it a step further, and I would have done it this way. Son, you're not Ryan Johnson. I mean, this was, this was something that happened to me when I was originally in, um, I, I was in high school when when Phantom Menace came out. And I remember I came in and I was talking about it and I was like, oh man, it was so good. It was so this, it was so that. And this one guy goes, literally stood there and was like, well, it's not what I would have done. I'm like, the fuck? <laughs> and I went, I went, are you George Lucas? Well, no. Can you uh, slap a product name on it and it will sell because it has that product name on it well, no okay then shut the fuck up literally this ain't your universe son are you ryan johnson are you jj abrams are you kathleen kennedy are you disney no then shut it this ain't your universe, son. 
Look, you want to write a fan fiction, go right ahead. Okay? But before we end this, let me read one more thing. This is a tweet from Mark Hamill. Um, he, uh, somebody had, had uh, posted up a tweet talking about some of the things that he said about Ryan Johnson in an interview or, or on set and then somebody had asked him about it in an interview a little later. And Mark Hamill came back out and said this. I regret voicing my doubts and insecurities in public. Creative differences are, common, are a common element of any project, but usually remain private. All I wanted to make was a good movie. I got more than that. At Ryan Johnson made an all-time great one. Hashtag humbled Hamill. Then he posted um, a picture of Ryan Johnson. Um, a picture of him... Of, of of this is Mark Hamill, a picture of Mark Hamill, and then a picture of Ryan Johnson on set, another picture of him and, and Ryan Johnson on set, and then another picture of him and Ryan Johnson at like one of the pressers for um for uh, Final Fantasy A or sorry Star Wars Episode Eight. I'm thinking Final Fantasy because I've been playing a bunch of Final Fantasy lately. Um, for Episode Eight, okay, and it says. Shout out to at Ryan Johnson for no particular uh, reason other than being my friend, collaborator, and guru, and guru. You quelled my fears, listened to my endless stream of terrible ideas, and occasionally used a few of them here and there. Hashtag genial genius. Hashtag thanks from a grateful Padawan. And then the last one that he posted. So, so to kind of give you an idea, the first one there where it says I regret voicing my doubts was from the 26th of December 2017. The next one I don't I don't have the actual date of it, but he's still wearing the Christmas hat, which means that it was probably around the same time. This one was from the 29th of December, 2017, um, from Mark Hamill, and it says, "I'm really enjoying the conversations about the Last Jedi, both pro and con. Everyone's entitled to their own opinion, but let me make one thing perfectly clear." Neither at Disney nor hashtag Lucasfilm has ever complained or told me what to say ever. Hashtag period, end of story. Okay? Um, and then... <laughs> um, this one journal uh, called the Anon Journal on Twitter wrote uh, a tweet that said, Breaking exclusive, at Hamill himself did not, Luke's, did not know Luke Skywalker's fate until he saw the premiere. Disney was angered for the bad press Hamill was creating around the image of Luke Skywalker and hashtag The Last Jedi and decided to seal his fate in post-production. Then Jeff D. Lowe responds on December 26th and says, At Hamill himself, just making sure you've seen the, the best Mark Hamill Last Jedi rumor on Twitter, crying laughing emoji. Hamill himself writes back to Jeff D. Lowe and also to um, the Anon Journal. <laughs> um, well, he's writing mostly in response to the Anon Journal. says, Amazing. Every word in that tweet was is wrong. No wonder they have Anon in their title. I want to remain anonymous... I'd want to remain anonymous if I were spewing complete BS too. Hashtag Disney angered. Final scene to surprise me. Ha 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 And then crying laughing emoji. And then says what a and then hashtag what a load of Sith. And that was on the twenty and that was on the twenty sixth of December twenty seventeen. So basically, people thought that like Mark Hamill, like fought with Ryan Johnson on set, and you know did some things because there was there was one. There was one point where basically somebody was on set during the day, during the time that this happened, and they and they wrote an article basically saying that, you know, Mark Hamill fought with, with Ryan with Ryan Johnson about his character direction and the and the way that they wrote his character and all of this stuff. And he had come out in a in a in an interview right before the movie premiered. And kind of said, yes, there were some tensions between Ryan Johnson and myself. Yes, we had some different, we had some creative differences. But then he goes on to say, you know, I can honestly say that in the end, the the end product speaks for itself. So just go out and see the film. It's going to be wonderful. 
most people don't do that. They just clip the part that just shows him being, you know, oh, I was just, you know, this was just a crap movie. <laughs> and, like, they don't, they, no, they never look at the parts where he's saying, guys, <laughs> I may have had some creative differences with Ryan Johnson, but that's all part of the creative process because you can't, because there was another interview where he goes, where he said, you can't live with a character for your for 30 years when you know cuz he goes back in the 90s George Lucas came to me and like told me that he had a plan for Luke Skywalker and so i had in my head all the directions that we could go with this character and he goes here comes Ryan Johnson and he sits down and he hands me the script and he starts telling me all the stuff that he's doing and i'm going that's not what i had in my head all the time what are you talking about and he goes, but he walked me through the choices that he made. He walked me through what he did, why he did it. And it made sense to me. And so I decided to put aside my own personal feelings of what I thought the character should be and listen to the writer-director who was telling me what he wanted the character to be. And in the end... I think he turned out a much better film because if it had just been me as an old wizened Jedi teaching someone, we've already seen that. You know, if if she just walked up to me, handed me the lightsaber and said, here you go, and he'd been like, yay, here you go, here's how to use the force, I'll teach you, we've seen that. He goes, I think it was a brilliant direction to take the character in. This was Mark Hamill, okay? And that's, and that's why I think that a lot of people like this have no clue what they're <coughs> what they're talking about. <coughs> One second. People like this have no idea what they're talking about because they cannot see past their own egos. The minute that you think that you can craft a better story than what is put out on the screen is the minute you've lost the conversation because it's not your story to tell. Look, you want to tell your story about what you think happened at the Jedi Academy, okay, with Luke? Write a fanfic. I said that before in the previous video. Write a fanfic. Do it. Go on. But don't you come around here and start saying, well, see, um, you know, I would have done, you know, my, my brother said that, you know, he would have done it this way and then I would have taken it one step further. Because now you're putting your own expectations on what the story should be. <clears throat> not what the story actually is. And because it's not living up to your expectations, now, all of a sudden, the story has problems. Because in, in your mind, they didn't earn it. How would, how would Luke running off to go find Leia turn Kylo Ren to the dark side? Hmm? Can you explain that to me? You really didn't. You just said during that time, he would just, you know, basically turn to the dark side. That's not turning to the dark side, son. There has to be a catalyst. Remember episode 3? Anakin didn't just turn to the dark side. He turned to the dark side because he sensed the death of Padme. Okay? He was told by the Emperor that he could... That, that the Emperor could help him save his wife from certain death. And when he confronted Mace Windu about it, he's like, I need him. And then he cuts off Mace Windu's arm in anger. That was his catalyst for falling to the dark side. It was his wife. Kylo's reason for falling to the dark side was Snoke was feeding him lies. Okay? And what had happened was is that Snoke was basically telling him this is what you're going to do. And all he needed was a jump start. And that jump start was Luke Luke thought for a fleeting moment that he could end it all by ending his own nephew. 
but he realized that that wouldn't do anything. Because dark side begets dark side. If he struck down his nephew, even if he was doing it for an altruistic reason, it's still a dark side reason. And he realized that at the last second. But not before his nephew woke up and saw his uncle standing over him with a lightsaber in hand, poised to strike. And in his mind, the mind that was poisoned by Snoke into thinking that, you know, he was this all-powerful Jedi and that he was going to be able to rule the galaxy someday, okay, he's like, huh, my, ne- my uncle wants my power. Shink. <laughs> I mean, that's 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 literally the only reason that he did it. And if he had if he had stayed his hand for two seconds, he probably wouldn't have become Kylo Ren. If he had listened to Luke go, Ben, no. Stop. I'm sorry. I didn't mean it. Let's talk about this. He wouldn't have become Kylo Ren. But he didn't. Because of the lies that Snow had fed him. And that's what we hear in Episode 9 when he goes to Exegol and, you know, he's literally there... <coughs> And the Emperor's like, I've been every single voice you've ever had inside your head. And it and it and it starts in, in Emperor Palpatine's voice, and then it morphs into Snoke's voice, and then it morphs into Vader's voice. Because it's it's literally you know, it's literally Emperor Palpatine saying, I'm the puppeteer. I've been pulling your strings there, buddy boy. You think you're here? By accident? Like I led you here. But that's the point. That's earning it. Okay? And if you cannot see that, you have no business standing there saying, I would have done it this way. Because you're not the controller of Star Wars. You're not the person that they're going to look to to make the next Star Wars film. Okay? Or to remake The Last Jedi to to make it the way that you want. And I've said this a hundred times before. Even if they were to take every single idea out of every single, you know, Star Wars fans head and try to make the perfect Star Wars trilogy it would still fall utterly short because the people would have all these ideas of what it could be and it would be not what they wanted because they would take those ideas and expand upon them and then expand upon them and 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 then would just get it just a feedback loop at that point and see the problem was is that people were looking at the Luke Skywalker of this okay the the new Jedi order you know piece of shit Luke okay they, they, they were looking at the Legends EU crap fest Luke instead of the original trilogy Luke. And this guy's going, but I don't understand how they got from Return of the Jedi to here. Well, it's pretty simple. They threw all that Legends EU fucking bullshit out. Now, I'm not saying all of it was bullshit. But there was a lot of it that was just done, that was just rehashing old plot lines and old lines... And, like, 
I mean, if, if you go back and start, like, really looking at a lot of the different characterizations of Luke, I mean, I mean, some of the stuff that happens in a lot of those books was so outlandish and so idiotic that it was like, how did anyone at Lucas film and Lucas books think that this was okay? And like you look at you look at like the the Jedi Knight version of Luke from from Jedi Knight Jedi Outcast and and um and Jedi Knight Jedi Academy he's literally an ascetic monk he, he his whole entire time he just has his hands clasped behind his back and he speaks in platitudes and who the fuck would allow a padawan learner who's barely even trained Okay, I mean, granted, yes, you get to put your points where you want them, but that doesn't mean that you're a fucking master, okay? You're still an apprentice, you're not even a full-fledged knight. Go and fight a 5,000-year-old Sith Lord ghost by themselves, and a person who has more Jedi training than they do, by themselves. Are you fucking serious? Have you have you ever even fucking played this game? Jedi Academy. I mean, don't get me wrong, it's a good game, but the story is just out there for Star Wars. Because it's meant to make the player feel like they're almost invincible. When in reality, you get your ass handed to you. I mean, at least at least Kyle Katarn should have been there to fight with you. I mean, he is walking around the whole entire time. Oh yeah, Tavion's a really bad person. Yeah, you know, she was she was under Dasan, you know, before and blah blah blah. And then and then just fucking lets you go off and fight him on your own. Really? All the while, Luke's standing at the Jedi Academy. Yes, um, well, it just seems like that uh, they've tried to drain all of the dark side force energy out of these places and blah, blah, blah. I didn't think there was any, like, you know, I thought the force was ever present. Now you're telling me that there's, like, dark side places and light side places? I mean, I understand that there are places that have probably been twisted by dark side users. But the force itself is not inherently light or dark it's just there it's again the intent of the users but that's my point okay and i know it's been almost an hour and 15 minutes um <clears throat> so i'm gonna go ahead and call it here I, I could go on and on and on and i'm not going to um smash that like button hit subscribe drop a comment below let me know what you think of the series so far um it just it makes me angry when people do this kind of crap. Oh, I could craft a much better story. No, you don't. <laughs> no, you couldn't. And if you think you can, then write a fanfic about it. Okay? But don't come out here on the internet and say, Oh, well, you know, you people talk about, you know, this, and, you know, they, they've got to earn it if they want to do it. They did. You just didn't like it, so you're going to go out and you're going to say, Oh, well, it, it's just not that way. Well, I'm sorry to say it is. Okay? So shut up about it and deal with it. And go back and watch the film again. And you'll see that they actually do earn it. Okay? So, when we come back, um, we'll get on with Fallacy 4. We'll, we'll finish up Fallacy 3 if there's anything left. And then we'll head on to Fallacy 4. And, um, and I'll, uh, you know... And, and we'll just kind of head on from there because I mean this is and and when we get to fallacy number six like I said before when we get to fallacy number six you're gonna go o m g did he really just say that the hypocrite <laughs> so anyway as we say we will see you on the next one